Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle, and they were gathered at Soko, which belongs to Judah, and encamped between Soko and Azekah in Ephes Damim. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered and encamped in the valley of Elah, and drew up in line of battle against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side, and a valley between them. And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze, about 120 pounds. And he had bronze armor on his legs and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, perhaps as big as 12 feet. And his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, about 15 pounds. Pick up a 15-pound dumbbell, put that at the edge of a stick, and try to wield it. And his shield-bearer went before him. He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why have you come to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves, and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. The enemy of Saul's time, the king of Israel, was the Philistines. And we've seen him battle them several times. And this time they're gathered again on on the hillside on either side. And there's a valley in the middle. But this time... They have a champion, Goliath, Goliath of Gath. Gath was one of the Philistine cities, so Goliath from Gath. Now, his name, I don't know why, but it always excites me a little bit. His his name would have been pronounced Goliath. Doesn't that just sound like a giant bruiser? Goliath. I picture them shouting his name when he's walking down, Goliath, Goliath. And here comes this big, you know, shaking the ground, fee fi fo fum coming out to the to the valley, because it said six cubits and a span. Now, a cubit is about 18 inches. It's a difference from your fingertip to your elbow. Now, you might say, well, that's a weird way to measure things, but how do we measure things? Feet. That's kind of weird, right? So, a cubit, 18 inches. So, if we got six of those, that's nine feet. And a span was about the span of fingertip to fingertip, so approximately six inches. We're looking at about nine and a half feet tall, this guy. If you like watching basketball, This is about two feet taller than Victor Wembenyama. That guy who looks like he's, you know, playing with a toy basketball in his hand while he's out there. Two feet taller than that. His bronze armor weighed 120 pounds. His spear, like 12 feet long with a 15-pound head on the end of it. This guy was enormous. Now, some of the other texts that we have say four cubits in a span. This is making it in the Greek translation and so on. That would have made him a little over six feet tall. But the original Hebrew has nine. So which is it? And you go back and forth. Well, the only reason anybody has ever said it's probably six is because they think it's impossible to have somebody that big. To which I would draw out to you, then why does the Bible make such a point of drawing it out? It's drawing attention to his height because it was unusual. Now you say, wait a minute, if he's that tall, doesn't that mean he's got like a disease and he's going to be really brittle and unable to walk? Well, no, because he's carrying 120 pound armor and he's got this giant spear in his hand. He's, He's jacked, this dude. He's huge. Now you say, how is that possible? Well, we know why. Goliath was one of the latter day Nephilim or descended from one of the Nephilim. What is this? Well, in Genesis chapter 6, verse 4, before the flood, we get a very interesting little note that just kind of skips over, although it does come up later on in the Bible, where it says that the sons of God, which is a euphemism in the Bible for angels, right? The sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were beautiful and went into them and bore children. These were half-demon, half-human offspring that were born. And it says, these were the giants the heroes of old, all right? And it says they grew to great stature. They were called Nephilim, which is a Hebrew word that means fallen ones, the fallen ones. And this is what caused the Lord to say, that's it, that's the last straw, I'm flooding the earth. But if you read Genesis 6, 4 carefully, it says this is what happened before the flood and also afterward. 
meaning this is an event that was repeated. And I don't want to get into all the, the history of this, although it is very interesting to look at how many cultures have legends of demigods, half god, god, little g god, half man, that perform these amazing feats and also are incredibly fierce-tempered, incredibly sinful, and have a destruction in their wake everywhere they go. Hercules, Cuchulain from the Celtic myths, even Merlin is one of those stories, Maui in the Polynesian, uh, the Polynesian stories. This is what happens in history, that this was a thing that took place. And it's one of the reasons God sent the children of Israel into the Promised Land and told them, don't leave anybody alive. Does it make a little more sense when you realize that? In Joshua 11, verse 22, it tells us that Joshua, they were killing all the giants, right? There were Anakim, which the Bible tells us was a kind of Nephilim. It says, there was none of the Anakim left after the conquest in the land of Israel. Only, so where are the only places the Anakim are left? Gaza, Ashdod, and Gath. Gath. So Goliath is descended from these Anakim, which somewhere in that line there had been a demon that had not kept its proper place and had polluted the bloodline of man. And this is where we get Goliath. That means that Goliath represents for Israel a failure to subdue the land. Standing there challenging them is the evidence of the fact that they had not done everything God had called them to do. And now they have to face it. Not only that, but what was the most impressive thing about Saul? His height. He was tall, remember? Head and shoulders above everybody else. He'll make a great king. Look how tall he is. You know, we, we still do that to an extent sometimes, but that's Saul, head and shoulders. Who's going to stand against that guy? Well, how about the nine and a half foot tall giant? All of a sudden, your strengths look pathetic, don't they? And listen, while it's not always going to be a Philistine giant in your life, maybe never will you face an actual Philistine giant, but there will be dangers and problems and enemies and obstacles in your life that you are going to have to face. And I'm not just talking about the everyday you know, struggles of life. Oh, the grass grew. I got to go mow it again. No, there's going to be things that set themselves against you, challenge you, and stand against you and everything that God stands for. These things usually grow out of a previous failure to do what was right in your life. Isn't that the case? Most big problems that we face are because we failed to handle something earlier. You don't deal with that attitude that somebody has early. Then later on, it it bears bad fruit. You know, we talk about Absalom in the life of David. When Absalom was seducing the people to support him and David did nothing about it, well, eventually, it led to the place where David had to flee his own kingdom. Not only that... Our problems, our obstacles from the enemies will usually grow in the exact inverse to our strengths and expectations. Well, I don't got to worry about that. We don't have to worry about battle. We've got tall. I've got Saul. He's taller than everybody else. Now, all of a sudden, your strength doesn't look so good. That's why the Bible tells us, you who stand, take heed lest you fall. The devil is clever enough to know that you're probably guarding your weaknesses pretty closely. But he knows you might not be watching your strength as closely. This is how many great generals have won battles. They don't attack where everybody expects them to attack. They attack at the strongest point, and it so overwhelms the enemy. They don't know what to do about it. But it is up to the men of God to face these giants. And David sets a very manful example for us to follow in this story. You all know how it goes, but I love this passage because I really see this as summarizing the purpose of our ministry here at Calvary Chapel. I know we're here to worship the Lord and and preach the Word and all that, but To what end? To what purpose? It's because there are obstacles, giants, enemies all over the place taking a stand against the people of God. And it is my job to equip you to go back to your domain, to your sphere of influence, to your valley of Elah, and you face the ones in your world. Not just to say, I hope someone comes in to save us, but to say, I will fight Goliath. And through this passage, we're going to see how the Lord prepares us to do exactly that. Verse 12. Now David was the son of an Ephrathite of Bethlehem and Judah. If you don't know where all these locations are, you probably have a map in the back of your Bible if you want to check that out. But Ephrathite of Bethlehem in Judah, named Jesse, who had eight sons. In the days of Saul, the man was already old and advanced in years. 
The three oldest sons of Jesse had followed Saul to the battle. And the names of his three sons who went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, next to him Abinadab, and the third Shammah. David was the youngest. The three eldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. For 40 days, the Philistines came forward and took his stand, morning and evening. So 40 days, Goliath is coming out, defying the armies of Israel. And Jesse said to David, his son, Take for your brothers an ephah of this parched grain and these ten loaves, and carry them quickly to the camp of your brothers. Also take these ten cheeses to the commander of their thousand. See if your brothers are well, and bring some token from them. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. Well, fighting. <laughs> fighting, avoiding fighting, more like. And David rose early in the morning, left the sheep with a keeper, and took the provisions and went as Jesse had commanded him. That may be the last time David ever stands in that sheepfold, by the way. And he came to the encampment as the host was going out to the battle line, shouting the war cry. And David goes, oh man, just in time. And Israel and the Philistines drew up for battle, army against army, and David left the things in charge of the keeper of the baggage, here, hold these, and ran to the ranks and went and greeted his brothers. As he talked with them, behold, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came up out of the ranks of the Philistines and spoke the same words as before, and David heard him. Little interesting thing here. In verse 12, it almost seems to introduce David to us again. We already met him in chapter 16, where he was anointed by Samuel, and he began to be the musician in Saul's court. And then you get this thing where David was the son of an Ephrathite of Bethlehem in Judah. Uh, we're going to see, as you get into Kings and Chronicles especially, it's going to tell you uh, some of the sources that they were using to compile these accounts. They'll say, this is written in the account of Gad, the seer, or Nathan, the seer, or the book of Jasher, or the book of the wars of Israel. So uh, it's kind of how Luke said, I was going around, everybody's written the accounts, I'm going to bring them all together. Sometimes I think you can see where uh, Samuel or whoever it was that was compiling these things uh, brought them together and, and maybe you see where a certain story would have picked up where the other one left off. Or Samuel just wanted to reintroduce David again. It doesn't matter either way. I just think it's kind of fun to see the process sometimes. It doesn't say anything about God's inspiration or inerrancy. It just reminds us of how it would have been done. So David has been splitting time, it tells us. He was ministering to Saul and he would go back home and tend the sheep. That's going to be significant later when we see that Saul has a hard time recognizing who he is. He's sent to bring food, and he arrives just in time to see the army take the battle line. So he rolls up, this young man, teenage years probably, and says, hey, you know, I brought some food for my brothers, and there goes the army shouting the war cry. You know, what time is it? Game time. I don't know what they were saying, but something like that. And he goes, hey, man, you hold the cheese. Like, I'm, going to, I'm going to watch the battle. And he sees them take the line, and he hears Goliath come out. Now, we should remember that the New T uh, Old Testament, for good reason, has very likely sanitized what Goliath was saying to these people. We know what trash talk sounds like. And now we add blasphemous trash talk into the midst. And he hears this. Now, David is going to be the one, spoilers, who's going to win this battle here. We know he'd been anointed by God. But when you consider this, how exactly had David been prepared to fight a giant? I'm going to make it very plain. It was through David's everyday life and his ordinary service that he was made ready for this. David had not gone through giant killer training. He was a shepherd, right? And it was through that that God was preparing David. This was his moment. From this point, he's not shepherd boy anymore. From now on, he's David, the giant killer, the general, the renegade, the king. This was his moment. God had prepared him for it. But if you see, how did God prepare him for it? We're going to look at it and say, wow, tending sheep, that's pretty ordinary. That's pretty mundane. But you know, that is how God prepares his giant killers. If we're talking about facing obstacles, facing down even people sometimes that take a stand against the will of God. How am I going to get ready for that? The good news is that God uses the ordinary to prepare you for the extraordinary. You don't believe me? How did God prepare Joseph to deliver all the people of both Egypt and Canaan? He had him learn management as a slave, and then as a prisoner. He learned how to handle things. He learned how to organize Pharaoh's, uh, Potiphar's house. He learned how to organize the jail, so that by the time he was ready to organize Pharaoh's house, he knew what he was doing. Now, he might not have thought that was all that interesting, that I, I should have been a wealthy sheik back in Canaan, and instead, I'm the manager for this guy's house. 
For Moses, how did Moses learn to become the great prophet? Well, sheep again. Something about tending sheep, man. The Lord used that to prepare Moses, humbling him so that he would only and ever listen to the voice of the Lord. How did Jesus Christ become prepared for the ministry God had for him? You might say, well, Jesus didn't need preparation for anything. Read Hebrews again. He learned obedience. He was made sufficient to be our sacrifice. What did the Lord have Jesus do for 30 years? He was a carpenter. Construction. That's how God got Jesus ready to be the Messiah. He grew in favor with God and man and in heightened stature through construction. Mundane, everyday stuff. He wasn't a, a rabbi. He wasn't a prophet. He wasn't a scholar. He was building tables and hanging doors. For Peter, it was fish. For Paul, it was tents. The Lord uses our everyday lives to prepare us, which is great because it tells us it takes some of the pressure off. If I'm ever going to be a great man, I've got to do this and that. No, you need to do what God has given you well and trust that through that, God is doing way more than you understand. This is why in Matthew 25, in verse 21 and 23, in the parable of the talents, the master said to his servant, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Many times we stress about how we're going to be, how we're going to handle it when we have much, when we've got a lot, when we've got that big moment. How are we going to handle it? The way you prepare for that is by handling the little things now, not despising those little things, those small days. If you can't run with a footman, as God said to Jeremiah, you'll never race with the horses. So if you find yourself tending sheep, but you feel like you're meant for so much more, yeah, you probably are. But the way you get ready for that is by handling the small matters as they arise, not despising your position, because it absolutely and totally does matter. We're a very fame-focused culture. I don't think we're unique in that. Don't ever get the impression in your mind that because I'm not known for what I do, what I do doesn't matter. Even things like being, you know, in your, your job or being a mom, like if there's not people celebrating you on the internet, then what's the point of it all anyway? You just trust that God sees that. And the people that you're serving see that. And then maybe the Lord will bring you on something bigger. He probably will. A man of God does not seek glory or seek position. But what does he do? He tends sheep just as faithfully as he would rule a nation. Because it's all the same if God's called us to do it. Verse 24. Now, remember this. David has watched the men marching out to battle singing their victory song, shouting the battle cry, lining up, and all the men of Israel, when they saw Goliath, fled from him and were much afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who's come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. And David said to the men who stood by him, What shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine? And takes away the reproach of Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in the same way, so shall it be done to the man who kills him. This is just embarrassing. The glorious army of Israel runs away from a single man. Now, you know what? I can't help but wonder, why didn't you just rush the guy? Bring it on, one-on-one. On one. It's like, I, I don't think so, pal. Arrows, fired, you know, something like that. But you can see they're so intimidated that they, none, none of them want to even be the first one through the breach, even if there's 100 people with them. A lot of us are going to die before somebody takes that guy down, so it's not going to be me. So now they're so intimidated, they're running away from the battle line. Imagine what Goliath said that. Despite the prize of the king's daughter, you get to marry into the royal family. Your children may very well one day sit on the throne of Israel. And apparently she was some kind of beauty, the way they're talking about her. You get to marry Saul's daughter. Have you seen Saul's daughter? But look at this guy. And David goes, wait, you said what now? What happens if you kill this guy? Riches and power and marrying into the royal family? And none of you want to do it? Now David is, is indignant here, and rightly so. He's angry both at the Philistine this uncircumcised Philistine, this non-covenant member, this fallen one who's going to stand there and defy the army that God said one man will put to flight a thousand and dare to stand there and say that. But he's also angry at his own countrymen for allowing this to continue so long. We even say, so we're going to see in a minute that uh, his brother, 
is going to fight with him. I actually skipped that part. Let's go ahead and read it. Verse 28. Now Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David. (laughs) Anger ever been kindled before? Why have you come down? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your presumption and the evil of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. And David said, what have I done now? I love the way the ESV translates that. What have I done now? Was it not but a word? And he turned away from him toward another and spoke in the same way, and the people answered him again as before. When it says there, was it not but a word, that is the literal translation. The older ones had there, is there not a cause? The word for cause is the Hebrew word davar, and that literally means word. So it could be that he's saying, using that word euphemistically to say, isn't there a reason to be saying like this? Or it could be David is just a young teenage brother, and his older brother is embarrassing in front of everybody. He's like, what did I say? All I said was, why don't you go fight that Philistine? Because he's the one who's fired up about it. When God raises up a man, he puts the fire of the cause he wants him to attend to in his heart, greater than in other men. This is how you know God is calling you to do it. Moses had that burning in his heart for the children of Israel in slavery. Elijah had that burning of his heart for the prophets of Baal and the the denunciation of the prophets of the Lord. Paul had a burning in his heart for the gospel going to the Gentiles. William Carey had that fire in his heart for world missions. God put a fire in my heart to plant a church here in Trustville. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, 16, describing this fire, he said, If I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting, for necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. Oh, Paul, I love that you, you're so brave and bold in going preaching the gospel to the Gentiles. He goes, don't thank me. That, that, that burden is so heavy on me, I'd be miserable if I didn't. So I'm really doing it out of self-interest more than anything else. That's kind of what he's getting at. Jeremiah 20, verse 9, he says, every time I say I won't speak anymore, it's like there's a fire shut up in my bones and I must speak. You know, anger is not always a sin, friends. Anger can cause you to sin. But the Bible says the Lord is angry with the wicked all the day long. There are days where you are going to see something wicked or wrong or evil being done, and it will flare up that indignation in your heart. Strong emotion can be the stirring of the Holy Spirit toward righteous action. So you need to pay attention to your reactions to things because that may be where God is calling you. If you hear that story of that testimony or you hear about this thing going on and you're, you just feel that fire rise in you or that burden, your heart is just broken for it or that incredible excitement, that's probably because God is calling you to do it. When you see the need and you see the prize, but it seems like nobody else can. David's like, this is so obvious. Go fight the giant. Why are we talking about this? Why is this complicated? And if you feel that way about a certain aspect of your life, maybe there's a a relationship that needs to be handled, maybe there's a ministry thing that needs to be done, maybe it's a cultural thing, and you feel like nobody else notices, it could be because God is moving on your heart and is stirring you, and you are going to be the means that God uses to handle that issue. That's why I always say, if you're passionate about something at the church here, you do it. Not because I don't want to, but because I can recognize that if God is stirring you, it's because he's also calling you. But when you start speaking out with fire, when you start speaking boldly and identifying the way forward, people will be offended by you like Eliab was. Can I just tell you that right now? When you step out and say, we got to go slay the giant. What are you saying? We're cowards? I didn't say that. I'm just saying there's a giant right there. And the first man to kill him gets to become the prince of Israel. You point out some you know, uh, mission endeavor that needs to be done. Hey, we need to go over this country and we need to preach the gospel there. So what, you, you're just so arrogant to think that your religion is better than everybody else? Or you point out, hey, this is where we're going to move. This is what we're going to do as a ministry or as a congregation or as a church. Sometimes other churches will get offended at you. Because they what? Well, you think that if it could have been done, we would have done it by now? No. I'm just saying, there it is. Let's do it. It's God's leadership within you. And you've got to ignore the false accusations and just say, there it is, and God's calling me to do it. Verse 31. When the words that David spoke were heard, they repeated them before Saul. So apparently David's causing quite a stir in the camp here. And he sent for him. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. I love that. Let no man's heart fail. He's saying, Saul... Nobody has to worry about anything. I hate seeing you guys like this. I'll take care of it myself. (laughs) 
That's David, man. That's why I kind of just throw this out there because it's Father's Day and I care very much about men's issues and things like that. Be very careful. You don't squash the enthusiasm and zeal of your sons. You know, very often we want to kind of keep it a certain way and keep it under control, but they need that fire. Give them an outlet for that fire. Let them, let them cook, as we say sometimes, all right? But Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. You're but a youth, and he's been a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant, which in the Bible, when they say your servant, it's a way of referring to yourself in the third person out of humility. So your servant, I, used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I said, oh, well, chalk that up to cost of doing business. No way. I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he arose against me, I caught him by the beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. David refuses to back down. He's already got an incredible strength of character here. He's not letting other people, naysayers, get in his head. There's no way. There's the need right there. There's the enemy. Don't get at me. Don't waste all that energy on me. If you're that angry, go kill him. But apparently he's like, Saul, you've got to do something about this kid. So he brings Saul into his, to his pavilion, and David goes, Saul, don't worry about a thing. I've got this. Maybe his voice cracked when he said that. Do you think that might have been? I'm going to kill this Philistine. <laughs> I'll fight him. And Saul initially refused but eventually, that bold faith won out. Listen, I want to keep our theme going here. And If you're going to wait for somebody to give you permission to slay the giants, to tell you that it's okay, you're going to wait a long time. Because most people are going to be naysayers. Now, you can have angry naysayers like Eliab. Who do you think you are coming from out of nowhere? You just, you, just wanna, you just wanna try to show everybody up and you're scared to death just as much as anybody else. You'll get those people. Like the, when I came and planted the church down here and I had a number of people. I was closing on my house and the person across the table said, what do we need another church down here for? There are churches everywhere. Why would you plant a church here? I'm sitting there signing off a, you know, an awful lot of money to come move down here and do that. And I was like, uh, well, the God told me to. So, oh, whatever. Yeah, you're going to have that. But you know what you're also going to have? Well-meaning naysayers like Saul. Saul is not angry. He's like, David, you can't do this. Yeah, it's great that you want to be a warrior, but he's already got a decade on you. And he's been doing this. And he's also nine and a half feet tall, David. He'll step on you. You've got to stand alone if necessary. Elijah did in 1 Kings 18, 22. He has a battle of the prophets on the top of Mount Carmel. And Elijah said to the people, I, even I only, am left a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. You've got to take your stand in a cause that matters. There may be maybe somebody's causing trouble in your family. And everybody else is scared to death to say what needs to be said. And they're running all over everybody. And you know that if I step up to handle it, everybody's going to be mad at me for upsetting the balance, as bad as it might be. You've got to do it. Maybe at work, things are trouble. There's problems. People are, are doing things that are illegal or they're doing things that are corrupt or just nasty. You've got to step up and say something. You know, an awful lot of these things where we see the, the various gender stuff or you see the, just the weird anti-Christian stuff that seeps into all these institutions... If the believers that were already there had stood up ahead of time and said, absolutely not, I won't stand for it, then there might not have been as much of it. I love that folks are standing up now, but guess what? You don't have to wait that long. Well, I don't want to rock the boat. Rock the boat, friends. Let them know that you can rock the boat. And now they'll have to worry about you as a representative of Jesus. And they'll have to take into consideration what the Lord has said about things because of you. Take your stand in a cause that matters, and God will be with you, especially as men and fathers. We need to be the ones who agree to fight Goliath. Well, should there be somebody more qualified? No, it's you. Your wives and your families are counting on you. Dad, don't, don't make your wife have to be the one to handle it. You handle it. You step up. Somebody's harassing your kids. Somebody's causing trouble. Somebody's making your life miserable in your own house. You handle it. You step up and handle it. Bare your teeth a little bit. And let them know, you're not going to be able to do this to my family. 
You've got people, you've got circumstances, you've got threats socially that are coming up. You be the one to step up. Activate your courage. Be brave. Most of us are probably not going to be the ones that stand in a line of battle with a sword and a shield. But there are other battles, and sometimes those are harder because it's, mu- it's pretty clean when it's like it's you or me and we've both got pistols. That's pretty obvious what needs to be done. But when it's matters of conversation, when it's matters of dealing with people, when it's matters of even business or things like that, it can be complicated. But don't wait for permission. Don't look to other men. You can do this. Like Numbers 14, 9, when Joshua and Caleb saw giants like this, remember what they said? They are bred for us. Bread, I'm going to take you, I'm going to rip you to pieces, and I'm going to dunk you in gravy, and I'm going to eat you, because you're bread for me. Bread for us. The challenges that you face in the strength of the Lord, nothing can stand against you. So be courageous, even if you've got to be lonely while you're doing it. I love this section here. And you guys realize David and Goliath could be like a whole series of messages on its own, but... Then Saul clothed David with his armor. Very generous thing to do. He put a helmet of bronze on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. And David strapped his sword over his armor. And he tried in vain to go, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them. So David put them off. Then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the brook and put them in his shepherd's pouch. His sling was in his hand and he approached the Philistine. You really got to give Saul credit here. Whatever his thinking, he's agreeing to help David fight, and he's recognizing that God's hand is upon him. Now, maybe Saul's thinking went something like this. All right, look, the shrimp is going to get barbecued out there. So may, it's, it's, no one's going to win. We might as well send out the kid. That way the army will be intact for the inevitable, inevitable melee that will follow. Maybe seeing this handsome young boy get killed will rally the troops to him. Maybe that was his thinking, or maybe he just had faith. Saul was not entirely wicked, but whatever he did, he gave David his armor and his sword, which is a noble thing to do. But David could barely walk in this stuff. Never mind that Saul was way bigger than him, head and shoulders, remember, and David's just a a kid. But he's not trained to fight in that way. Even if he had that stuff, he doesn't know the defensive capabilities of male and using a sword. Because when I fight lions and bears, I use my sling, which was still a deadly weapon. Not enough to, you know, take down a giant with a bronze helmet on, but it's still a pretty deadly thing. Whenever you have to step up to the fight, when there's a a circumstance you've got to confront or a person you've got to confront, that giant, whatever it may be, I hope you've got some examples in your mind, some things in your personal life you're working through, but there will be an accepted way to handle these things. You're going to go fight a giant, you wear the heaviest armor you can, you take a sharp sword, and you go out to battle like that. Maybe it's appropriate qualifications. Who are you to tell me how I ought to be treating people? You're not, some, you're not a psychologist. You're not a therapist. How are you going to tell me what to do? Maybe you don't have the funding or the resources to do it. Well, that's a great idea, but you don't have the money. So what do you think you're doing? Maybe you don't have the experience. I've never done this before, so how am I supposed to do this? And you might not have those things. But David knew this. David knew that without God, there was no hope anyway. David knew even if I had all the armor and I had the sword, that's not going to guarantee victory because I'm fighting a giant. And if God's not with me, we're going to lose. So he said, I'm just going to trust God's sovereignty. I'm going I'm to play to my strengths and give God an opportunity to work. David would write later in Psalm 18, he would say, For by you, to the Lord, I can run against a troop. And by my God, I can leap over a wall. He trains my hands for war so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. When the moment comes, you will learn that your preparation was better than you thought. David fighting off lions and bears and wolves and all that. His struggles as a shepherd taught him, well, first of all, to be brave. He had to learn, kid, I know you're scared of bears, but that's why you're here, is to fight bears. So he had to learn that. He had to learn to charge into the battle, right? He also had to learn something to do with warfare. He had to learn how to kill things. He had learned that. And even though he didn't realize he was training to fight Goliath, he was. And when you're going through that mundane preparation that I talked about before, you'd be surprised how God is perfectly fashioning you for the task he has. I spent some time down here driving a junk truck, in case you didn't know that. Did it for about a year. I was the operations manager. Now, there were days where I thought, this is the worst thing I've ever done in my life. What am I doing on this truck? I have a master's degree. I had those days, right? 
But I'll tell you, friends, I learned so much doing that job that is going to last me the rest of my life. I had to learn how to hire people and fire people. I had to learn how to get people to do what they needed to do when they didn't want to do it. I had to learn how to oversee a lot of resources, a lot of money. I had to learn how to schedule things. I had to learn how to navigate people that wanted different things. I learned how to have tough conversations, how to terminate employment when I needed to sometimes. It put a lot of backbone into me. I needed that. because so I was coming out of a situation where it's not like it was all, you know, cake and roses. But I was in a place where I was loved. The people that were in leadership supported me. And if it ever got too rough, I had backup I could call in. So what does God do? He says, let me put you in a place where you have no backup. And you get angry people screaming in your face and saying they're not going to do what you want them to do. Well, how is that useful in ministry? <laughs> how is that useful in leading people? It's important. I didn't think about that at the time. I didn't think about the fact that during this process, God was training me to be a better leader and to be more confident in myself and also to trust God and to know what it's like to be in a, in, a, in a situation with adults that nobody really cares about what Jesus has to say about things. It was important. So in your life also, God is using your mundane everyday life to prepare you for the spiritual things he's called you to do. But you should realize that doesn't mean that the thing you're being prepared for is the thing he's going to have you do. Now, you might say, David, you're, you're training as a shepherd. What do you think he might have thought he was being trained for? I don't know, maybe to be a good father, maybe to you know, be, have a big sheep business and make a, make a lot of money and, and build a temple for the Lord one day. No, you're being trained to kill giants. So, you know, this, is, this happened. You know, I used to handle internships from Liberty at my old church, and they would come in, and there were some people, they did not want to do anything unless it was specifically exactly what they wanted to do. I'm not trained for that. I'm not prepared for that. I'm supposed to teach adults high doctrinal messages. I don't want to speak to these fourth graders that don't even understand the word predestination. I'm not, I'm not equipped for that. It's like, really? Because you'd be surprised what teaching children's ministry will prepare you for, my friends, right? <laughs> God knows how to prepare his man. So in whatever you're doing, get to know God. Get to know God before the battle starts. Much easier that way. And he will equip you. And then you've got to trust him. Well, verse 41 and the Philistine moved forward and came near to David with his shield bearer in front of him. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him. For he was but a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. And the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field. And David said, maybe this wasn't such a good idea after all. <laughs> David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand. I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give the dead bodies of the hosts of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the field of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. What a scene this is. David comes out to battle. Here comes Goliath down in this valley. There's armies on both hilltops. And here's Goliath. And Goliath looks at him. And he sees a pretty little kid, handsome little boy. It's like, this, this kid, this, he thinks he's going to do something. It's kind of like, yeah, you won't be pretty by the time I'm done with you, kid. I'm going to knock your face in. I'm going to rip your head off. And I'm going to feed it to the birds of the air. And the animals are going to eat your body here in this place. And David's response was not to say, well, you know, that's, I understand you saying that. I understand why you're angry, Mr. Goliath, but, you know, I'm really going to have to ask you to leave because this is our promised land and, and you've got to go. You know, he didn't say sticks and stones may break my bones. No, he said, oh, no, 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 no. You're standing on my turf, which is my God's turf. So you're going to come at me with your sword and spear and shield. You think you can take me down with that? I'm going to cut your stinking head off, Goliath. I'm going to cut you to pieces and all your army. I'm going to feed them to the birds and to the beasts of the field. Now, if David's mother had been there, she might have said things like, where did you learn to talk like that, young man? <laughs> Certainly not in this house you didn't. You've got to get the picture here. David is not just out. All the, all the, it's fine, but all the depictions of David is always like this mousy little dude who just happens to be able to hurl a, you know, a, a rock and kill lions and bears. But 
He's out there giving it right back to him. And David has completely removed himself from this situation. He doesn't say, well, you don't know how many bears I've killed, Goliath. He says, this is about God and his glory. And you've defied the Lord of armies. So you know what? You're going down. And you think I'm going to get eaten by the birds and the beasts? No, you people are going to get eaten. I'm going to cut your head off and carry it home with me. What do you say to that? What is the first step of any action? When it's time to face that giant, what's the first thing you've got to do? You've got to speak out boldly, make your intentions known, look the enemy in the eye, and face them down. Most of the time, that is all you need to do. Would you believe that? So many people, so many bad situations, so many movements. One person stands their ground and says, I've had enough of this. Oh, and they fall away. Not all the time. But it happens. Moses had to stand before Pharaoh. What's the first thing Moses says? Let my people go. There's no ambiguity about that. There's no, hey, buddy, let's cut a deal here. He says, this is what you're going to do. And if you don't do it, I'm going to make you do it. And God's going to help me. Elijah told Ahab, except at my word, there will be neither dew nor rain for these years on the land of Israel because of you. And then he sees him again, and Ahab goes, oh, there you are, you troubler of Israel. And Elijah didn't go, hey, man, you know, we don't need to use words like that. You know, real men don't do that. No, he says, you're the troubler of Israel. You're the one that brought all this down. So let's have, a, let's have a challenge. Bring it on, me against whoever you got. What did John the Baptist say to the Pharisees? Who invited you, you brood of vipers? Go bear fruit worthy of repentance. Then maybe I'll baptize you. There's no room for ambiguity when you're facing down the giant. And sometimes we try to soft pedal it so that there's a way out if we want to. But God's champions take their stand. Everybody knows exactly what they stand for. They face down the enemy and say, I'm going to stop you. That doesn't seem very nice. That doesn't really seem like New Testament Christianity. Really? Go read it again. Go read the book of Acts again and see how Paul talked to people. Go read the, the epistle of Jude and the epistles of Peter and James. Go read the book of Revelation and what it's going to be like when Jesus returns. Sometimes the most loving thing, kind thing you can do is step up, plant your feet and say, no further. Ezekiel twenty two thirty, 30, the Lord said, I sought for a man among them who should build up the wall and stand in the breach before me for the land. What's the breach? It's when the line of battle breaks and everybody is fleeing and the enemy starts pouring in or when the wall gets torn down in a specific place. God goes, I wanted one guy to stand in that breach and say, you got to go through me first. He said, but I found none. God goes, I was looking for one person to stand up in Israel and bring them back to the Lord, and nobody was there. That tells us there are times when God wants to demonstrate his power. He wants to show his mercy. It is God's will for it to happen, but everybody is too afraid to speak up. Isn't God always going to do what he wants no matter what? Read the passage again. The Lord allows in existence for people to make their decisions. You can affect what happens by what you do and what you say. You've got to be the one to step up and do it. Can I say this also? It wasn't in my notes, so maybe I need to sharpen this a little more, but let me just say this. A lot of times we get panicked because we think, well, I don't know if this is the right way to do it. I don't know if this is exactly how God would want me to do it. I don't know if, if they're going to get upset. I don't know if they're going to get angry. What if I never see them again? What if everything collapses? What if I lose my house? What if I lose my money? What if they hit me? This might not be the right thing. And, and pastor, are you sure this is okay? Sometimes, friends, you know what you got to do? you got to step up there and say, I'm just going to handle this. We'll handle it and we'll sort it out afterwards. Because most of the time, you're not in sin when you're dealing with evil. And you feel like you're being forceful or strong. you got to plant your feet and take the charge. Silent disapproval is not going to bring down Goliath. But people taking a bold stand on both their feet looking him dead in the eyes and saying, the battle is the Lord's. Verse 48, here we go. When the Philistine arose and came and drew near to David, David ran, I love that, let's go, I'm not waiting for Goliath, toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the ground. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. There was no sword in the hand of David. And that's where all the kids' movies end. But that's not where the story ends. <laughs> then David ran and stood over the Philistine. 
and took his sword. Whose sword? Goliath's sword. And drew it out of its sheath. He's looking like, you know, one of those Japanese cartoons with a giant sword over the back of his head. Because these things were too big for him. And killed him and cut off his head with it. That tells us Goliath did not die immediately when the rock hit his head. David stands over him with a sword and chopped his head off. What do you think David said in that moment? What do you think words were exchanged between them? Maybe he told you. <laughs> when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. And the men of Israel and Judah rose with a shout and pursued the Philistines as far as Gath and the gates of Ekron, so that the wounded Philistines fell on the way from Sharaim as far as Gath and Ekron. And the people of Israel came back from chasing the Philistines, and they plundered their camp. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem. But he put his armor in his tent. So he keeps the armor. I saw some dude online. It was the weirdest thing. They were expecting there was some weird spiritual, why do you think he took the head back to Jerusalem? What, what are we supposed to get from it's not that spiritual, guys. They probably took it home and put it on a pike and said, thus always to those that challenge the Lord. Well, that seems so barbaric and brutal. Well, it's in your Bible, friends. Maybe we have weak stomachs, but that's what they did. It's total victory. And I love that David ran to meet Goliath. He didn't try to, like, you know, shake and bake and get around behind him. He just ran towards him, whirling that sling. I, I like to think, you're supposed to, pick up from this, by the way. This is a miraculous thing. Some angel probably grabbed the hold of that rock as soon as he let it go and just, boom, just rammed it right into his head. And then there's, I bet there was silence across that valley when Goliath fell. Broken only when David is holding up the head of the dead Anakim. I mean, dude, nine and a half feet tall. And he's a, how big is this head? Holding it up. And then the army routed the Philistines. This is where I will promise you that you will have your victory if you will face that giant down. Because 1 John 5, 4 says that everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. It wasn't a, a sling that won this battle. It was David's faith that won this battle. The Lord supported him. Maybe all you can see is everything you lack. The crazy mismatch. You know, I've got to have a conversation with that person, but they, they just, they speak so well and they speak so fast and I'm just not eloquent like that. That's what Moses said about going to see Pharaoh. Also what Jeremiah said, by the way. Maybe you think, look, I'm trying to handle this situation, but it needs a lot of money and I don't have that much money. Maybe that's all you can see. Or whatever the situation might be. Maybe there's an actual person that's causing trouble and you go, that, that dude is huge and he thinks he can do whatever he wants, but he's harassing my family. I've got to do something about it. If you pick a fight, though, that God can support, and you trust God, you should expect divine assistance. If you are devastated by what the giant is doing, you're devastated by what's happening to your country or your neighborhood or your family, just imagine what victory will look like. And I mean, like, do that right now. Think about that situation that I'm talking about. I'm trying to be vague because I wanted to apply to lots of situations that you're facing, that you're dealing with. And you can't, you can't get over, and it's so awful. Just think to yourself, what would it look like if it was all done? The Philistines gone. Goliath, his head on a pike. Spoils of war. The people full of faith again. That's how I have to think about this, this building thing that we're launching on. Like, yeah, I know, that's a lot of money that I don't have. And it's going to be a long process, and there's a million things that can go wrong. But all I can think is, but what about when it's all done? It's all done, and we're there worshiping, and we have this amazing spot right on that drag where everybody comes by, and they see the name of Jesus exalted and the word being taught. I, I just, that's worth the fight, isn't it? You consider your life. You consider maybe the turmoil that's happening across the dinner table. If you finally deal with it, what will that be like? Wouldn't it be nice to be done with it, that besetting sin that you're facing? Don't you want to be done with that? I want you to see this. You should expect divine assistance. God will honor your courage and you will inspire others around you to charge into battle. The Philistines cannot stand against the Lord's army. Victory is there for the taking. You shouldn't be afraid. The Lord is with you. I'm going to finish it up here. Verse 55. As soon as Saul saw David go out against the Philistine, he said to Abner, the commander of the army, Abner, whose son is this youth? And Abner said, as your soul lives, O king, I do not know. And the king said, inquire whose son the boy is. And as soon as David returned from striking down the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. <laughs> I love that image. Whole, you know, this, is, this is war, man. 
You know, this is not you know, Junior Asparagus here. He didn't, didn't chop off that pickle's head. But David's standing there holding the guy's head. And Saul said to him, Whose son are you, young man? And David answered, I am the son of your servant, Yashai, Jesse, the Bethlehemite. It is interesting that Saul didn't seem to know David. Perhaps some time has passed. Uh, it could be that uh, the previous passage, when it talked about him becoming Saul's armor bearer, that that passage was kind of giving the full picture, and then now we're getting the details. It could be, and I think this is probably the most likely thing so far, that uh, David was a musician in Saul's court. He didn't spend a lot of time you know, hanging out with the people that played songs for him. But he was one of the servants among many that he had. But it is just interesting. You know, I once saw a video I was making the rounds where there was a pastor complaining about how everybody takes the story of David and Goliath and they apply it to their own lives instead of seeing that this is supposed to be about Jesus defeating sin. To which I'd say, okay, yeah, it certainly applies that way. But let me tell you what this passage is about. This is about God helping his people overcome an impossible obstacle when they have faith in God's power and they step out to confront it. Yeah, Jesus is the ultimate example of this, but it applies to you too. I want you to see here that God honors those who honor him. Courage catches God's attention. 2 Chronicles 16.9 says, The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to give strong support to those whose heart is blameless toward him. Y'all, God is looking for somebody he can help. He's looking for somebody who is willing to face down that giant. And if it's you, he'll help you. That means whether you are a shepherd or an accountant or a king, the giant killer is within you if the Lord is with you. He can use what preparation you've had to bring you to the next step and conquer the next thing. Tend your flock well and serve the Lord, and that will prepare you for the day when Goliath starts bellowing his challenge across the valley. And you can step up in the strength that you already have, supplemented by God's power. There is no giant God cannot slay if God's men will rise up and show courage with bold action.